Wisconsin's public colleges and universities are in transition. Two-year UW system colleges are merging with four-year universities. Some four-year UW campuses are planning to cut academic programs. And to control property taxes, state aid to the 16 tech technical colleges has more than doubled in four years. And Foxconn will need a trained workforce. So it's a perfect time to interview two newsmakers in part of this discussion. Morna Foy is president of the Tech College System. Morna, welcome. I see. And Ray Cross, president of the UW System. Thanks very much. So I want to get into some of those issues, but first of all, I really am curious, take the long lens look. Biggest challenges to your systems over the next five, six years. Morna, please. Well, I think it's really looking at how we deliver our programs. Not what we're delivering, but how we're delivering them. You hear a lot about people talking about students need to be college ready. Do they have the right preparation in high school to be successful in college? Well, as institutions, we're looking at how can we be student ready? How can we better assess their educational needs? How can we deliver programming in different formats that is a better way for more different kinds of students to learn? Um, so we're really looking at changing our delivery systems and the way that we design and um, offer our programming more so than uh, what it is that we're teaching. I think our track record in placement and in satisfaction from both students and employers in this state show that we, we deliver the right program. It's just now being more creative about how we do that. Wow, I'm gonna pursue that after I give Ray a chance to answer. Challenges over five, six years? I think here in Wisconsin, uh, as is true with Warner and the tech colleges, how best to deliver content in, a, in a, an effective fashion. And the infusion of technology is obviously um, uh, opening up doors that weren't open before. On top of that, I think that uh, the demographics will be challenging both of us, uh, not only because there are fewer working age adults or college age students in the next 30 years, but, but because we are also uh, it's seeing an increase in the population 65 and over. Uh, so that challenges us in a lot of ways, not just financially, but uh, how do we deliver coursework and programs for that, for that particular section of our population. The, I think the other thing that will impact us is how do we prepare students for the workforce of the future? And, and we are good at, I think both of us would argue that we are preparing students effectively for today's um, needs. 30 years from now, though, as many as 65% of the jobs that will exist then don't exist today. So how do we prepare students who will be in the workforce for the next 50 years? How do we do that? Do you agree with my premise that both systems are in transition now? Biggest changes in the last couple of years? Ray and then Morna, please. I, th I think all higher ed, not just our systems. Or at some, or in some stage of transition, but I think that's always been true. Perhaps more so now because the velocity of change is the acceleration of change. My grandfather probably saw one or two major changes in his lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've probably seen several. My kids are seeing that in within a month, uh, and I think that's going to be true. So the, the, the speed of change is accelerated. System in transition, Morna. Um. I, I would agree with Ray that I think you know higher education in general, I hope we are constantly changing and evolving with the body of human knowledge. Um, that's our, our line of work. So we need to stay um, fluid and we need to stay flexible to respond to that. But for me, um, the biggest change has been driven really by the change in our, in our students and what they expect from a higher education experience and how rapidly they expect to be able to make adjustments, um, how portable they expect their experience to be, and that means they don't um, feel as compelled as we might have uh, to pick one place to go to school and go there for a set amount of time, get a credential, and never ever have the need to come back to school again. Um, it's much more typical now for students to um, go to multiple institutions before they get a single credential or to get um, two of the same kind of credential, two associate degrees, two bachelor's degrees, a bachelor's degree and an associate degree, maybe not in the order that you might think. Um, and so that is forcing us as institutions to innovate and adapt and, and 
create the infrastructure that allows that kind of lifelong learning to take place. And that really, again, it, it requires us to look at all the ways that we deliver our, um, our product, our, our educational programs, and also how we um, work with faculty and what their expectations are and the staff. Uh, we talk about whole college environment. It's, you know, students um, don't come in and expect to be talked to for an hour, four or five hours a day. The old lecture system. Yeah, and then, you know, take a couple exams and that's, you're done. You've shown your, your uh, capacity. So I think that they're changing their access to other in sources of information besides us and our faculty. Um, we need to adapt to that, and that's, that's only going to accelerate. Ray's absolutely right about that. I want to come back to something Ray said. Do you see your systems in competition for Wisconsin's best and brightest in the high school class of 2018, 2019, and 2020? Are you, are you competing for our best and brightest? Ray, you, you, you kind of alluded to that earlier, so please. I would say no. Uh, however, I do think we need to collaborate more and compete less. Um, it, and a lot of it depends on how effectively we identify what students want to do and what their desires are and how good we are at it because we need to be directing students in their direction and they need to be directing them in ours. Mm -hmm. But our ability to collaborate, uh, more so now than it's ever been, is critical. And if you complete a two-year technical degree, there should be a path for you to do further education that isn't complicated or full of barriers. And I think Morna would agree. We, we want people to get off this road when they're comfortable doing that, when they have opportunities, and to get back on uh, easily. And that's a challenge, I think, that higher ed, not just in Wisconsin, but everywhere between systems, is trying to navigate effectively. Thank you. Morna, your thoughts on that? I would say absolutely not. Um, to tell you the truth. No competition. Okay. Well, we don't have enough of our high school graduates going on right out of high school. I mean, there's less than 60% like of new high school graduates in this state go on to a post-secondary experience right away. I'm sorry, let's back up. Less than 60%. Less than 60%. Thank you. I want to clarify So, um, and you know, for our economy to be firing on all cylinders, we need a highly skilled workforce. We need folks with post-secondary credentials of all kinds um, at a much higher rate than that. And then that doesn't even count all the adults who are many years out of high school and still don't have a post-secondary credential. So I think there's, a, there's plenty of business, there's plenty of opportunity. We need to do a better job of communicating to folks the value in those credentials and the portability of them. And as, as Ray just mentioned, you know, getting something is, a, a, um, at, at any of our institutions, getting a credential can't be the end for folks if they want to have successful, fulfilling careers going forward. That's how they're going to best prepare for these unknown jobs of the future. It's going to be how they best um, position themselves as individuals to make a career change or to advance in their organization if they're, if they're happy there. So we need to create that sort of infrastructure and communicate to folks that it's in place that they will be able to move back and forth, that they can come back to school, they can finish a different credential without repeating work, without spending a whole bunch more money, um, that they're going to have their work and life experiences evaluated. Uh, we both are in implementing a lot of programs that do a better job of assessing folks' um, skills and knowledge that they have and giving them credit for that. Um, and all of that is an important way that we are going to reach a bigger part of the market than we're reaching now. We're not anywhere near saturation, so I think um, there's a lot more we can both do together. You mentioned the current e economy. You must be facing in both your systems different set of demands when, when our unemployment rate is 3.4 percent as opposed to X number of years ago when it was 8 or 9. So mm -hmm. how, are, how are the needs different when our unemployment rate is 3.4, the lowest in decades? Since you brought up the current economy, maybe you could go for first. Laura. Well, for us, there's typically um, a sort of inverse relationship. When there's lots of job opportunities out there, um, they're, they're enrolling. They don't. No, they they, they don't enroll because they go into the workplace. Thanks for correcting me. Or uh, they they're enrolled and they get plucked out of our classrooms because folks are just they can't wait. They need uh, help now. They need employees now. Mm -hmm. um, but in the past, you could really track this market. You know. 
unemployment goes up, our enrollments go up. Uh, the, the economy gets better, our enrollments go down. Now um, we're finding that folks want to go back to work but they don't want to give up on the pursuit of an academic credential either because they know that that's going to be the difference maker in the next downturn. That's going to be the difference maker when they go on to that next promotional opportunity. And because a lot of employers are hiring them out of taking them out of school, mm -hmm. they want them to get the credential eventually. So what that's um, meant for us is that it's been more encouragement to build the pathways. It's been more encouragement to build articulation agreements with four-year institutions because employers are willing to support those efforts. They're willing to send their employees back to school and pay for it if we can create the structure to support that. Um, and if we can make sure that it's a stackable credential and not something that they're going to have to start over at square one and you know make another long-term commitment that will get interrupted by a work opportunity. So it's it is really um, pushing this sort of more flexible and more um, adjustable kind of educational programming. Um, and it's been a lot of, given us a lot of support to do that. I, 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 f I am hearing more and more from employers their willingness to want to be a partner in that process because, frankly, for them, and this is something where the unemployment rate really kicks in, is it is hard to find quality workers. No hiring, no hiring, no it hiring. It is so hard and it is so expensive. I'm not sure that those of us, you know, really can appreciate it once what it means to turn over your entire frontline workforce every 30 days. Yeah. And that's the situation for some of our state's employers right now. Yeah. So that's a huge expense. And if they can find an employee um, who has no post-secondary credential or who has a partially started one, that they like um, and that who likes them, um, they're willing to invest in them. They're willing to support that parallel journey of career and college and university. Um, and that's a great place for us to be in, I think, because it really makes them our partner in the process of lifelong learning. Great, different demands on the UW system when jobless rate is 3.4? I think the jobless rate is 3.0 right now. Oh, thank you for the correction. <laughs> um, and probably will be in the twos before long. Um, we uh, we experience similar kinds of enrollment trends. So when the uh, economy improves, people go back to work rather than to go to school. What Mona alluded to, though, I think is really important. We're both trying to find effective ways to reach the 750,000 plus individuals in this state that have some college but don't have a degree or a, as Warner referred, some form of an academic certificate mm -hmm. or completion uh, certificate. And that's really important for the future of this state because all research suggests that uh, some college is needed for just about every job in the future. The Georgetown study argues that 99% of the jobs that have been created since 2007 require some college. And that's important for Wisconsin. And we're behind our neighboring states in the terms of number of individuals with degrees, both at the baccalaureate level and at the associate level. So uh, w we need to work on that. And that's something we're trying to do. Competency-based models, direct assessment models, evaluating competencies, knowledge, capabilities that individuals have, and awarding credits for that is, is critically important uh, for the future, particularly for that workforce, that portion of the workforce that doesn't wish to come back to a dorm or a residence hall and, and enroll in college for a period of time while having to live there. They, they're going to want to do this on their time, mm -hmm. and that's critically important. You may not be competing for high school students, but you're competing for state GPR dollars. So let's, let's take a look at this summary of uh, recent changes in the funding. And let's look at the UW system first, Ray. Your general fund budget, now this is not all funds, of course, but this is from the state checkbook, has gone uh, a decrease of $4.8 billion. My source here is the Legislative Fiscal Bureau. Um, in the 2013-15 budget, two years, $2.25 billion, down to $2.14 billion. Um, that's a decrease. Uh, I want you to put that in context, sir. I will try. First of all, we've lost about 
uh, I'm going to say roughly 5,000 students. And of course, this 2.14 uh, uh, billion is about a billion dollars, roughly, in round numbers of state resources. About 200,000 of that is, a uh, little over 200,000 is debt service. So we have somewhere between 750 or so million in, um, in operating uh, budget from, GP, from GPR. The rest of that is tuition. So that makes up a larger percentage of this 2.14 billion. Uh, so it, when your enrollment drops by 5,000 students from 180 to 175,000, some of this is attributed to simply an enrollment decline Thank uh, you. across the state. And of course, the tuition has been frozen for uh, six years at the end of this biennium. Uh, that portion of that's been flat. And on top of that, of course, we did receive some reductions in GPR over this time period you've outlined here, Steve. So you put all that together, and this is not surprising. Um, Lorna, uh, let's, yeah. let's look at the tech colleges. Over the same four-year period from, uh, let's look at fiscal 15 to fiscal 19, your operating budget is up 2.4, right? the systems is down 4.8. But there's a curious Percent. change here. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Um, there's a curious change here in that the legislature and the governor decided to double the amount of state aid to offset property taxes. Now, doesn't that pose an interesting decision in the future and whether that's, that can continue given Governor Walker's emphasis on controlling property taxes? I'm just struck by that policy decision. Well, and I think this, uh, the chart is a, a little um, confusing. Fix um, it. Because the 4.6 million is an annual amount. So in the previous budget year, you were looking at just the second half of the biennium, they made that switch. Um, in this 1719 biennium, it's still $406 million of property tax relief okay. on an annual basis. That hasn't changed. Um, and I don't see that changing. Um, I think that was a pretty unique situation the state found itself in to have those kind of dollars available. Um, but truthfully, that was after many decades of um, increasing reliance on property taxes. If you'll recall, prior to making this switch, um, we were getting upwards to 70% of our um, operating dollars in the system were coming from property taxpayers. Property and that was a, 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 had been built up over time um, to a point where instead of a, a more balanced um, distribution of our funding coming from the state, from property taxpayers, and then from tuition revenues, um, it really had shifted. Nobody wanted to um, rely too heavily on tuition and um, for good reasons. I mean, for many years our system didn't even charge tuition because many of our students are also property taxpayers. So they are paying um, to support tech colleges through their local property taxes as well. So we have been asking and um, arguing for an, a, a big uh, state uh, reinvestment for many years to try to right size that, that shift to too heavy a reliance on state property taxes. Okay. So th this was a, a one-time change. Uh, the dollar amount hasn't changed um, on an annual basis since that time. And I think now we're just, you know, we're much more um, closer to 45% uh, coming from the state. Um, students now actually pay a higher percentage through their tuition um, than at any point in time. Um, but property taxpayers <coughs> are more in the 30 upper 30 percent part of our funding, which is really uh, a better balance. It, 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 it is making sure that all three of our major funding sources are a little bit more in line to okay. what they were prior to this shift. Right. We talked about the finances for the system. Just a question for the future. Is it time for the freeze to come off, sir? I know that's a major policy decision will be made in the capital, but your thoughts? I think it is. Um, I would argue that uh, I cannot defend the increases in tuition that we had prior to the freeze because we were increasing tuition at 5.5 percent while our fund balances were growing rapidly. I think that was a, dis a disconnect if you will and I believe that we have been we have righted that issue uh, and over the last six years we will have righted that and I would hope that we seriously consider at least a CPI increase in 
tuition in uh, the future. However, w w there may be another way to do that. If the state's willing to freeze tuition for two more years, maybe they're willing to uh, compensate for that uh, for each percent in a tuition increase. It's roughly seven million dollars annually. So there may be a willingness to say, we'll, all, we'll freeze it for two more years, but we will cover that through GPR increases. Now, there was discussion in the Capitol of freezing tuition on the tech colleges. Mm -hmm. w was it frozen? You'll have to remind me. I, I didn't think so. It wasn't. Okay. Um, but, you know, it was a different situation. Um, we have had uh, much smaller uh, tuition increases over the years. I think that was part of it. Um, we didn't have fund balances that were growing, um, mm -hmm. which was part of it. Um, and I think also it was just a different, um, a much different response from our students, actually, to the idea of a tuition freeze. They were very, very vocal um, and in opposition to freezing tuition. And that's they've done that now three times um, when the issues come up. So um, they seem to, f to feel comfortable things I hear from students are, I know where my tuition dollars are going, so I'm okay with that. Um, they feel like they're getting a good return on their investment. It is less expensive um, for them. Of course, it's a you know maximum two-year degree, so that's going to make it less expensive uh, up front. Right. But <clears throat> we just had a, um, we had a very, very active response from our student government. Um, and our, our student representatives in the Capitol about this issue. So that, that's been the difference maker, really. Ray, can you put in context some of the program changes on these two campuses? At Stevens Point, Superior, uh, 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 our graphic says plans to end, plans to add. Uh, can you just pick out a couple of these and put them in context, please? These are program changes on two of your four-year campuses, and they're getting, they're making a lot of news, my friend. I, I don't need to tell you that, so. Yeah. I think as it relates to the Stevens Point issue, which is most recent, um, the English degree that's currently being offered, uh, the intent there is to reshape that into a degree that has a more direct route to an identified career path. I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think the same is true for a couple of these other programs like political science uh, and, and probably also true for, for history. How do we orient those? We're not eliminating the liberal arts humanities content. What we're trying to do is focus them a little more directly in a career, toward a career path in those fields, which it, th these are excellent preparations for that. I would add, though, Steve, that I think it's really, really important that the foundational premise upon which the humanities and the liberal arts built is really important, even more so today than it has ever been. And I too often hear in the Capitol and elsewhere that the only reason for a, an education is to prepare one for a job. And I find that problematic. I think it's important. I think it's critically important. But education that, that allows one to be self-reflective and examine their own, why am I here? What am I doing here? What am I here for? Uh, it, 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 uh, some, something that also participates in, in a collaborative team building. I'm, I'm a part of a community. How do I fit into that community? Uh, the traditional roles of liberal arts. In addition to that, in a democracy, these kinds of things, critical thinking and the ability to understand logical fallacies, etc., is critically important. Those are foundational. So those four principles on what an education should be mm -hmm aren't excluded when you start getting more closely to a career preparation path. They're fundamental in every one of these, and that's, that's what an education, in, an educated individual should be. And the humanities and the liberal arts are so fundamental to that, given the probability that 65% of the jobs in the future don't exist today, so you must prepare them in the fundamentals so they can adapt. Morna, are the 16 technical colleges doing, are contemplating Re, some realignments like like the UW system. Um, I wouldn't say they follow this pattern, but you know we um, change programming all the time. Every year we add and drop many programs um, to the changing demands of our economy. You get an area in Wisconsin that is becoming 
uh, next generation um, in manufacturing, like the southeastern part of the state. Yep, which we're, um, where we're going next. We're going to be evolving all of our programming in the southeastern part of the state. Um, we've got a huge surge in logistics and um, supply chain interests up in the Green Bay area. So colleges up in that area are revisiting all their programming and deciding if it's still relevant. Um, we make a promise to our graduates that we are going to prepare them for career opportunities. So we need to make sure um, that those opportunities are out there. So we're, we're constantly evolving our programming to reflect changes in local and regional economies. Having said that, um, we do have um, five programs that, uh, across the state that offer an associate degree in arts and sciences. Um, and I don't see that changing um, because the truth of the matter is that both our students and our employers, who we consider our other customer group, um, are asking for that grounding. General education is an important part of any well-prepared individual. If you're working in manufacturing, if you're working in construction, you need to have foundational um, learning skills. As Ray mentioned, the process of learning does not stop, and it, it really cannot stop for anyone who is looking at being employed for the next 25 or 35 years, because the world's changing constantly. And if you don't have those sort of foundational um, skills, then um, it's very difficult to, to adjust and change. So we've always taught that at all of our colleges, and we will always continue to incorporate those foundational skills. Let's end the show by talking about Southeast Wisconsin. Let's talk about Foxconn. Sure. What role will each of your systems play in training Foxconn's potential 10,000 to 13,000 workers? Um, is there an agreement on the division of who trains? Well, anyway, what, what role will, will each of your systems play? Or not? Well, I think it's being driven by Foxconn and what kind of employees they're looking for and the numbers that they're looking for and how many of those folks um, they bring with them from other operations or and how many they're hoping to hire from um, the state's workforce. can tell you right, the most immediate demand they have right now is for construction and design folks. So that's going to... Um, rely on folks who have gone through, I hope, a lot of our construction um, and um, trades programs, but it's also going to rely on a lot of engineers uh, that are coming out of the UW system. And I think, um, you know, robotics, information technology, advanced manufacturing, those are all um, fields that people pursue credentials through both the university and the tech colleges in those industries. So. Um, we see a lot of um, future business, um, and I think that the behavior of the institutions in that area, UW-Milwaukee, Parkside, Gateway Technical College, at really at the epicenter, I think there's about 30 Foxconn execs who are actually housed on their campus at this moment. Um, Waukesha Technical College, Black Hawk, they are already have formed a higher education consortium, if you will, and they are busy at work building pathways so that folks who come into Foxconn, again, this new generation of worker, we're going to provide the educational infrastructure that Foxconn hopes to provide for them as an employer to make their um, career a lifelong career with them and as they move through. Excuse me, what, Ray, when you and I talked at the Wisconsin Counties event, you talked about the specific expertise that some of the UW faculty may set up and the synergies. Can, can, can you talk about that a little bit more? Well, I think it's more than training. I hope it's also education. Uh, but I would argue that uh, the partnership that uh, Morna has alluded to is really a powerful partnership between public-private institutions, technical colleges, universities, to determine how best to accommodate their needs. Identifying their needs is important, and we've been working with them in a number of ways to, what do you need first, and how might we work with you closely to advance that? Mm -hmm. I think there's another part of this, Steve, that if I may, I, I think it's the long-term employment needs, not just of Foxconn, uh, but of the whole state that's important. I'm really excited about this particular project. Advanced digital imaging is such a critical component of 
every sector in our economy, every sector, be it dairy, agriculture, be it retail, manufacturing, it doesn't matter. Digital imaging is going to play a major role in that. So the research piece of this in partnering with, with someone like Foxconn, this will become the digital imaging hub of the future. I'm an old engineer. We worked with limit sets, switches, photo sensors, thermistors to, to measure motion, to, to switch different mechanisms. That'll all be done with digital imaging at high resolution in the, for, in the future. It will require much bigger bandwidth capability than we have now. It'll require our Wi-Fi systems to be at a minimum of 5G. All of those things depend on research and the ability to advance that. And when you can see at 12 times the capability of the naked eye at 8K, you're able to do things that you can't do today using digital imaging. And I'm, I'm really excited about the, the long-term future of this. I see this as a whole transformation of Wisconsin's economy. Just like the auto industry transformed Michigan, just like the Silicon Valley transformed California, et cetera. This is transformed. Wisconsin will be the hub for digital imaging in the future if we do this properly. And it will impact everybody that lives and or touches this state. Well, a certain governor is fond of calling it a game changer, which you just defined. Um, are the existing cooperating systems in place between UW system and the tech colleges and the private employers now to really, as Wayne Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky said, skate to where the puck's gonna be in terms of Foxconn needs? Are, are there, is, is the synergy now been set up between your two institutions? Yeah, I think so because, I mean, truthfully, um, this is a, uh, a process that tech colleges go through all the time. Every time a state employee, uh, employer comes in new or an old one wants to expand, we go through this very uh, sometimes hard to get your head around process for um, those outside education, but sitting down and identifying right down to the individual skill sets, not just you know what kind of degrees or what kind of graduates do you want to hire, but what do you want them to know how to do and what do you want them to be able to think about um, and how are they going to contribute? And how quickly do you need them to move around? How flexible are they going to just do this one thing? Are they going to do many things? Are you going to want to be able to move them here and move them to other Foxconn locations? Um, so we go through that process, and, and I think that was a big help because um, Gateway was involved early on, and so the information that they have collected through that process, they went to, to Japan, to Foxconn's own university, um, and the curriculum that they are building has been shared both uh, within the tech college system and in this consortium that has been built in southeastern Wisconsin because be among the higher education providers. So I think really the biggest change is going to be in our mindset. Um, as Americans, we have um, not quite the same educational system um, we, we, I think, are a little more patient in waiting for folks to figure out what they want to do in life mm -hmm. and pursue um, things, which is terrific, but it can also happen simultaneously that you are building skills at a younger age and you are um, exploring different careers at a younger age um, so that you can make more informed choices as you get to be 18 and going off to college, or you get to be, you know, 25. So um, I think that's something that this process and Foxconn is, is quite eager um, and interested to know what, what are we doing with our dual enrollment programs? What are we doing to get folks excited younger about engineering? I mean, why in their minds doesn't everyone want to be an engineer? So that's, that's going to change, um, I think, over time, uh, and they're going to help drive that. It, they are doing some amazing, exciting things that honestly, you know, construction of the facility or actually running it are just a small part of some of the the medical um, innovations yeah, the that medical they're going to contribute to. It's are and just stunning. Um, you know, so now we've got nursing faculty that want to know how can they get um, connected to Foxconn. They want to talk to them. We have. 
um, you know, our security and law enforcement um, and cybersecurity folks, uh, Foxconn's um, innovations and research are going to, as Ray said, that's going to really touch on almost every industry that is growing in this state. Does system have a Foxconn task force? Right. Uh, we don't call it a task force, but we have a number of liaisons. Uh, the, the consortium that that Virginia, that uh, Morna uh, is, has mentioned um, has been very effective in identifying and working closely with them. What do you need, and how do we get prepared to collaboratively deliver that? And I think that's really important. It's, it's also important that you know other companies in this state that are also stressed for employee employees understand we're we're trying to work to to meet your needs as well. This is not just a Foxconn thing. I think Foxconn is pressing the issue perhaps more than uh, we would have been had they not been here. Um, but that I think is really an important message uh, that this is not just wax. We need to do the same thing for other employers. If your systems, if your institutions don't play a large role in training Foxconn's future workforce, who, who would train them? Out of state colleges and universities? You know, I think that that, that is really um, not the ideal situation, um, not just for um, us as institutions, but for Foxconn, because they have a very particular um, workforce and skill set in mind. They've been doing this for a while. It's not like this is their first trip to the rodeo, um, and it's not the first time that they have built um, this kind of facility or operated it. So they, um, you know, they're very clear about what they need, and it's not going to be able to be just picked off the shelf. I, I, what I see is uh, an exciting is that they'll be not just a mecca for innovation and industry, but they'll be a mecca for um, educational pathway opportunities that will draw people to this state who don't have the right skill set, but know that they can get it once they're here. So if that imaging R&D isn't done by your faculty, is MIT going to come riding in the sun? Yes, and that's what's exciting because we're actually having those conversations with with Foxconn as well, particularly in the areas of healthcare, et cetera. Okay. Okay, final question. Is it an exciting time to be presidents of the two public college or higher institution systems, Morna? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we have great jobs because we do great work and we get to work with great people um, at our colleges. There's nothing more invigorating or um, inspiring than to um, interact with folks who are advancing their lives and their careers through education. So our students are just a total thrill ride for me um, at any age, and I, I really love, love his work. You've got a pretty amazing ride too, Mr. President, don't you? Yes, there are days when it's not all exciting, but <laughs> most, <laughs> most of the time, it's usually because I screw it up or something, but <laughs> it, most of the time, as an educator, my whole career, the most exciting thing is seeing lives changed through an influence that you may or may not have had, but faculty have had, through an educational experience. And that is just, you cannot pay me for that. Hmm. That's great. Ray Cross, President of the UW System, Morgan Foy, President of Tech College System. Thanks very much for coming in. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for thank having you. Us.